I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Heather Hewson. Dr. Hewson is an Associate Professor of Animal Genetics in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. Dr. Hewson received her BS in Animal Science at Cornell University and PhD in Molecular Genetics at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. A significant part of her PhD work was done at the National Institutes of Health in the Human Genome Research Institute, and her postdoctoral research was with the USDA Bovine Functional Genomics Laboratory. She has a diverse background combining animal breeding, veterinary technician experience, and molecular genetics across livestock, companion animals, and wildlife species. Dr. Hewson competitively raced Alaskan sprint sled dogs for 23 years, participating in internationally sanctioned events throughout the continental United States, Canada, and Alaska. She left competitive racing during her graduate studies, but kept close contact with the sport as she studied the genetics of Alaskan sled dogs. Her research aims at improving animal health and performance by investigating the genetic regulation of economically important traits. In addition, she explores population structure and admixture to better understand selection, breed development, and conservation. Her primary research focus uses genetic profiles to identify ancestral and population dynamics and establish their relationship to performance or adaptation. Her work has identified genetic markers associated with athletic performance in Alaskan sled dogs and production or adaptation measures in livestock. The genetics associated with performance in working dogs remains Dr. Hewson's passion, and her research has expanded to other working dog groups, including guide and detection dogs. Her research also includes the study of canine aging in an effort to extend the working lifespan and quality of life in dogs. An end goal of her research efforts is to generate data that can be directly used as a tool to inform breeding and management. As a reminder, please post any questions you have for Dr. Hewson in the chat box, and she will answer questions from the audience as part of the live Q&A after her presentation. Welcome again, Dr. Heather Hewson. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much uh, for attending this uh, conference and being here to listen to my presentation on the genetics of Alaskan sled dogs. Um, I'm Heather Husan, and I think the first thing before we jump into all the research that I do is thinking about the topic that we're going to talk about, and that's sled dogs. And so with that in mind, I would like to know what most people think about sled dogs. And I bet many of you, these types of movies come to mind. So when you're thinking about sled dogs, especially when I'm talking to younger people, you know, oftentimes they think of all these different movies and how sled dogs are portrayed. With that in mind, certainly all these movies have uh, some, some semblance of reality in here, but also they are media. Um, I've seen all of them, and with this, I would say Togo is my favorite, and for anyone that's curious, it is probably the one that is the most realistic to sled dogs as well. Um, but now let's look at what do sled dogs look like today? So I bet many of you also think of, you know, when we do really think about what sled dogs are nowadays, is looking at breeds such as the Siberian Husky, the Alaskan Malamute, or even the Samoyed. These are typical breeds of dogs that are often thought of as sled dogs, and they have that in their background. Um, if you saw pictures such as these here, you also might look at that and think, yep, these, these could make sled dogs. I, I'd buy that. But now if I showed you pictures of these dogs, I, I would guess that many of you are thinking, this might not be what you thought of as a sled dog. And in reality, all of these different dogs are sled dogs. And they're modern sled dogs. They're dogs we use nowadays to race for competition, for recreation. Um, and once in a while still for, for working dog purposes to get one place to another. So with that in mind, why am I so interested in sled dogs and, and their genetics? For, for me, this is personal. So I grew up racing Alaskan sled dogs. And no, I did not originally live in Alaska. My family grew up on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, Southern Pennsylvania at that. And we raced sled dogs as a sport. So it was our family hobby and it was a great way to grow up. Um, we slowly just started moving north. We moved to upstate New York, a lot more snow there. Eventually, I moved to Vermont, and I continued racing on the East Coast, the Midwest, and Canada. My family raced, uh, but eventually, after graduating college, 
I did what many sled dog mushers aspire to, and I moved to Alaska. So I lived in Alaska in Fairbanks for about six years and raced sled dogs there. And throughout all of this time, I was very active in different sled dog kennels. Um, we raised, we bred our own dogs, we trained our dogs. Uh, you can see the pictures. Uh, I'm, I'm the middle child. That's my sister. That's the younger one there. But we started out with Siberian Huskies and, and moved into Alaskan sled dogs. So researching and studying sled dogs is something that's very personal and I'm very passionate about. So my motivation to study sled dog genetics is, is a couple different things. It was growing up in sled dogs and, and listening to the stories about, you know, the old sled dogs and their origins and different breeds like the Siberian and the Malamute and, and how they originated. But then with that, you know, as we were breeding our own dogs and we were competitively racing, you know, how do we mix in other breeds of dogs to increase speed or intelligence or endurance? Um, and as I got older and I understood concepts of genetics and heritability, well, then I was interested in how do I breed dogs to be a better performing dog. And, um, and of course, with that, we can't forget about their health because, you know, the dogs are alive so often. And so we want our dogs, you know, not only to be the best performing dogs, but to live long, healthy lives. So these were really my motivations for looking into sled dog genetics. But before we kind of go further into talking about, you know, the types of research that, that I do with sled dogs, um, there is one really important distinction because I use it in some of my research and I'll certainly be referring to it as we go forward. And that's in sled dogs. There's actually many different types of sled dog racing. And, you know, traditionally, I think many people are familiar with the Iditarod which is a thousand mile endurance race across Alaska. It's to commemorate the 1925 serum run. Um, so many people think of distance racing. And with that distance racing, you know, we're looking at these elite endurance athletes and they're running hundreds to a thousand miles. On average, the teams are going eight to 12 miles per hour. I didn't grow up racing distance dogs. In southern Pennsylvania, you can really race dogs, but not necessarily for a thousand miles. So my family grew up in sprint racing. So in sprint racing is kind of analogous to track and field as opposed to your marathon. So for us sprint racing, you know, we were running teams that were going anywhere from three miles to 30 miles. And that is considered sprint racing for a sled dog. If everything's relative. So if you compare that to a thousand miles, Three miles and 30 miles is really short. Um, and you'd run, you know, two to three heats of these mileages on the same course and your combined time would win. And you can see there is a difference in kind of the racing, the typical racing speed. Your top sprint teams are averaging more like 18 to 22 miles per hour and up to 25 miles per hour. So the bottom line is they're all sled dogs, but we have kind of had this unique, uh, uh, selection for either elite endurance or speed in our two different groups of racing. So to start out my my research and kind of really building on, on the genetics of sled dogs, um, I started this what seems like eons ago as I was starting to do my graduate work in genetics. And I had the fantastic opportunity to study sled dog genetics as my PhD project. So, so it was perfect. Um, with this said, I kind of went to the foundations, the origins. So what were the origins of sled dogs? Um, as you can see from these pictures, you know, sled dogs are a mixed breed dog. They have that Arctic breed ancestry, but they're an open population. You can crossbreed anything into it. Um, there's no select uh, specific definitions of size or stature, but yet because of their selection for athletic performance, there is, there are commonalities in what they look like and, and their body size and build. Um, so with this said, one of the first things I did was look at what is the ancestry of our modern Alaskan sled dogs. So I knew that they had dogs like, you know, similarities to Siberians and Malamutes, but I also knew that in, you know, modern dogs were breeding in dogs like greyhounds and pointers and that type of stuff. And so I used genetics just like companies offer such as Embark, 
where you can get your dogs tested and find out what their ancestry is. That's what I was doing with sled dogs. So I was sending in these samples of, I was genotyping my own samples really, and looking at what is the breed composition of sled dogs. And I'm doing this because the way that we do this in genetics is really with the idea that all of these different breeds have this unique genetic pattern that reflects signatures of, you know, breed specific traits. So their size, their color, their ears, their behavioral traits that are all breed specific, the genetics reflect that. So each breed has their own unique genetic pattern. So I wanted to see where did sled dogs end up after decades of selection for athletic performance, you know, what type of dog was I really seeing in the modern sled dog? And also, was there a difference between that breed composition in distance dogs versus sprint dogs? So the first big thing that came out of that study is to realize sled dogs are their own breed. So I went into that study thinking, I'm going to see, you know, Siberian Husky, Alaskan Malamute, Pointers, all of these different breeds. And, and the biggest thing that came out of this was sled dogs are their own breed. So while they're not recognized, you know, by the American Kennel Club, we don't have a specific, you know, written down description that sled dogs should look like this. Um, because of their intense selection for athletic performance, they do have their own genetic signature. And even that open breeding population where we can mix in other types of dogs, that still we can see those influences of other breeds, but sled dogs still have their own genetic breed. So they are their own genetic breed, just as distinct as a poodle, a chihuahua, or a Labrador retriever. So even though they look so different from one another, because of performance, they're their own genetic breed. With that said, I did and I, I found signatures from other purebred dogs within sled dogs. So while the majority of that kind of breed signature that you would see is, is their own breed of Alaskan sled dog, we would see signatures of Siberian Husky and Malamute. So definitely two breeds that have similar Arctic origins as Alaskan sled dogs. Um, but these two breeds were developed into purebred breeds. Then I also saw signatures of various scents and sight hounds. And these are dogs or breeds that have been more recently bred into sled dogs um, for their speed. Uh, there's even sometimes in occasional dogs, you'll pick up signatures of like a German Shepherd or even a Collie or something that was bred into a particular lineage. But the five breeds that you see here, the Siberian, the Malamute, the English and German short hair pointers, and the Saluki were the most common breeds that I saw as far as representing pure breeds within Alaskan sled dogs. So these are the purebreds that are in addition to that own unique Alaskan sled dog signature. So of course I want to take this back to performance. So not only do I want to know what is the ancestry of sled dogs, I want to know how ancestry influences their performance. And so I had rated um, these sled dogs that I had sampled and gotten their blood samples and DNA from, and myself and the sled dog owners that I was working with, we had a whole array of you know different traits that we were rating the dogs for. And these were everything from speed to endurance to work ethic, heat tolerance, injury, all these different things. So a few of them had some really interesting results when it came to how does ancestry affect these different traits. And the first and most notable thing was that Alaskan sled dog itself. So what this means is I had traits related to speed. So I had dogs that were identified as kind of the elite dogs for speed and dogs that were not as fast. You know, so I sampled an array of sled dogs. Some were better than others. I also had a trait that I called work ethic. This is my very polite way of saying, does the dog want to run and pull or doesn't it? And the hard part here is it's really hard to find a sled dog that doesn't want to pull. So when I do find them, they are a very unique dog because that's not common to sled dogs. So that Alaskan sled dog signature, that own unique genetic signature that is sled dogs, that was the most important genetic signature when it came to elite dogs for speed or their work ethic. So dogs that were elite had a higher breed composition of that Alaskan sled dog. 
Now, where did my purebreds come in? They came in particularly the Siberian Husky and the Alaskan Malamute when I was looking at those elite endurance dogs. So the dogs that were running the Iditarod, the Yukon Quest, thousands of miles there. So those dogs, while they still had their own predominant Alaskan sled dog signature, they also had a higher percentage than of Siberian Husky and Alaskan Malamute that were found in their breed composition. So that Siberian Husky and Alaskan Malamute, those origins were really important for that elite endurance uh, performance. And then another one we looked at was heat tolerance. So as climate change comes, sled dogs need to adapt as well. And while German short hair pointers have been bred into sled dogs more for speed, one of the other benefits that we've gotten out of this uh, crossbreeding is heat tolerance. So we actually found that sled dogs that tolerated running in the heat or warmer temperatures tended to have a higher degree of German short hair pointer ancestry. So with all of these, you got to remember that the predominant breed in these sled dogs is Alaskan sled dog. But when it comes to these other purebred dogs, these elite animals for endurance or heat tolerance had an increase in those purebred breeds as well. Now we took our study of heat tolerance a step further and we wanted to identify what are the genes regulating heat tolerance, not just the breed influence, but what are the genetics behind that? So what we did is we really compared dogs that performed well, even in warmer temperatures, versus dogs that really did not perform well in the warm temperatures. They did better in the colder temperatures. And we did what many of our genetic studies do, and we do this genome-wide association study. So I feel obligated as a geneticist to show you one of these plots, and I'm going to show you two in this lecture. So what this plot is, is that it's showing basically all of the little gray and black dots. These are markers in the genome, in the entire genome across all of those chromosomes. And the chromosomes are on that x-axis, the horizontal axis. Whereas the height of the dot in the little graph is showing um, an association, a statistical association between, it's a difference in that particular marker's frequency in the cases versus the controls. The dogs that had or tolerated heat better versus those that didn't. And the bottom line is we did this association study with, you know, thousands of variants that are in the canine genome. And I was able to identify a variation on chromosome 10. And this variation, this is how we kind of go back then and we say, well, what genes are in that region of the canine genome? And for this particular region, we identified the myosin 9 gene. So this is kind of how we go back and we say, what genes influence a trait? Um, and how we learn those things. So not only did I identify that German short hair pointers were important for this particular trait, now I know the gene that really influences this trait. And then on top of that, I could take the German short hair pointer component of that and look at the genetic code and say the dogs that had better heat tolerance have this particular genetic code in this region of the myosin 9 gene. In dogs that had poor heat tolerance, they had a different genetic code in that same region. And when we compare this back to the German short hair pointers, they are the ones that also commonly have this code that is for better heat tolerance. So we could see where basically the breeding of the German short hair pointer with the Alaskan sled dog was how we could bring this heat tolerance and this unique a genetic code that favors heat tolerance at the myosin 9 gene into sled dogs. So we're going to kind of keep on this thing, this theme now of thinking about the health in relation to their performance. And one of the health traits that we've been uh, chasing now for probably five years, it's not a very cooperative health trait in genetic research, is congenital laryngeal paralysis. So this is commonly referred to as wheezer in sled dogs, and that's because the dogs that are affected make basically a wheezing sound as they're breathing. So on this particular trait, my postdoc, Chris, he's been working on this. Um, the trait itself, so congenital laryngeal paralysis, congenital just means that it's present from birth in sled dogs. Laryngeal paralysis is really saying that one or both of the muscles that are in the larynx have varying degrees of paralysis. So they, they work to varying degrees. 
And clinical signs in sled dogs tend to appear somewhere between six weeks to nine months old. And you can hear things such as they're like a hoarseness to their barking or their voice, exercise intolerance, and, and again, that kind of wheezing or harsh uh, breathing sound that you hear. Now, with this in mind, the best way to diagnose it is, you know, with a veterinarian through laryngoscopy. Um, but that's not always possible in every situation. So for the dogs that we had in the study, some of them were done uh, at veterinary clinics through laryngoscopy. Other ones were diagnosed by veterinarians like at the kennel itself. Um, with this in mind, you can kind of see in the figures on the left, these are, you know, figures of what a uh, normal larynx should look like, as well as uh, the animated figure there, and then what a real larynx is, and this one is with laryngeal paralysis, so it's not opening as far as it should. So our study is really looking at the genetics of dogs that are affected with this compared to dogs that are not. But what do we know about congenital laryngeal paralysis? it doesn't just affect sled dogs. So this type of disease or, or very similar diseases affect many different breeds of dogs in different ways. So some dogs are similar to sled dogs in that it is congenital, it's uh, present at birth, but it depends on the breeds. There have been studies in the genetics and some dogs such as uh, uh, different breeds, they have a recessive inheritance where other breeds will have more of a dominant inheritance. For sled dogs themselves, it, it's not straightforward of just simply dominant or recessive. Other breeds acquire it in a different way. They're not born with it, but it's more a disease of aging. So as they get older, they develop this disease. So I have a Labrador Retriever that he's now 11 years old. He has developed this particular disease and it's getting worse as he gets older. So it's not just in sled dogs. But with sled dogs, it certainly has a major impact on their performance. So some of the earlier dogs that were diagnosed with this, uh, it was back in 1986 on some of the first clinical studies of this particular characteristic in sled dogs. Um, and it certainly affects their ability to perform. So it's a very big deal for any dog that's born and bred to be a sled dog. As they did the clinical research on this particular disease, some of the other findings they, they had with this is that the dogs tended to have blue eyes more commonly, white facial markings, as well as this kind of unique uh, oral mucosal tag that you see in the figure up in the right-hand side. So as we did with the previous study, we did basically one of these genome-wide association studies. And in this particular case, you see that we have like this major signal here on chromosome 18. So all of those red dots that are up higher this is showing us all of these different genetic variants that are differentiated between the dogs that have the disease and the dogs that don't. And basically, again, we go back into this region, we use databases and we say, well, what genes are in this region? So what genes might be influencing this? And in the big picture, can we find a causative mutation that's really causing this disease? And so with this in mind, we had a pretty big region in this uh, particular disease. And so it was more than one candidate gene that made biological sense. So we have, you know, here's four different genes. These genes are associated with skeletal and muscular development as well as neurological disorders. And all of those types of uh, biological processes make sense based on the clinical signs of the muscles that are in the larynx, as well as many of the, the different dogs that demonstrate these diseases um, many of them are also associated with some neurologic disorders. So that's why that one's up there as well. But we have multiple genes. And then the other thing that came up to complicate things is that blue eyes. So, so I noted in one of the early clinical um, studies of this, they noted that a lot of the dogs tended to have blue eyes. Well, in this same region on chromosome 18 is the gene ALX4, that has been associated with blue eyes in Siberian Huskies. So we were kind of stuck now because we noticed this, you know, blue eyed gene that's in the same region that we're looking at for the disease. And now we're a little concerned that are we inadvertently finding an association with blue eyes in our cases and maybe more brown eyes in our controls? Or is this really a place in the genome that is associated with the disease of laryngeal paralysis? 
Um, so my postdoc was tasked with, okay, try to figure this out. And he really did a lot of work on the statistics. And one of the challenging things here is that the trait itself is rare in sled dogs. There's not many dogs. We don't have many cases to work with. And um, we, we don't have, you know, the phenotype itself of laryngeal paralysis, it's really variable. So some dogs can be severely affected. Some dogs can have, you know, a really minor affected state. So <laughs> trying to kind of differentiate what is the causative mutation and what gene is really, you know, the smoking gun has not been easy. And the bottom line is we still haven't done it. So what we do know at this point is that We've done the statistics and all the cross-checking. We know that this region on chromosome 18 does play a role in the disease itself. Now, it might be linked to blue eyes, which we do really feel that it is. It doesn't mean that a dog that has blue eyes is going to have Weezer. But again, you have the correlation that a dog that has Weezer or laryngeal paralysis is more likely to have blue eyes. But we still don't know the causative mutation and we still don't know exactly what gene is the culprit. So this is one that we continue to work through, um, but it's it's the realities of genetic research uh, in animals and, and people. So this is one of those, they're not always a clean cut answer. Sometimes they are a challenge, um, but this is kind of where we're at and hopefully we'll be able to kind of differentiate this down the road so we can develop a genetic test uh, for sled dogs for this disease. So that's the end goal. Um, but lastly, thinking about health traits in sled dogs and specific genetic diseases, uh, we took the opportunity to actually use Embark. So I genotype many of my research dogs through Embark using the same genetic tests that you get in this commercial panel. Um, but with this, you know, I'm genotyping dogs for all these different projects, whether it's looking at ancestry or performance or if they're in the Weezer project. And, and as we did this, we realized, well, we have all of these sled dogs that have all of this other information that Embark provides. Let's look at it and see what it tells us about our sled dogs. So not all of our sled dogs were genotyped through Embark because I started research before Embark existed. But with that said, a lot of our dogs have been genotyped on Embark. Um, so what we've done then is my graduate student, Joe, he's taken this data from some of the dogs we had genotyped on Embark. So we have Alaskan sled dogs. We had Siberian Huskies. Some of these were racing dogs. Some of these were show dogs and pet dogs. And then Polar Huskies. So I haven't introduced them. But these were a, a group of 12 dogs, all from the same kennel. And they are distinguished as kind of their own unique group. So not specifically a sled dog, not specifically, you know, Siberian or Malamute. They look more similar to Malamute. They're a bigger, stockier dog. These are honestly your modern Arctic exploration dogs. Um, the woman that owns these dogs, she does uh, exploration in the Arctic. She takes scientists up. They take a dog team out. Um, they are amazing. It's terrifying. I would never do it. I love sled dogs. I would never do that. It's terrifying. Ice flows and all of this stuff. But I sampled some of her dogs as well because they are kind of a unique lineage. So with this said, we took all of those different health traits that Embark um, provides and we said, what is in, what's in sled dogs? Um, because in general, sled dogs are a crossbred breed and they're pretty hardy dogs most of the time. Um, so what we found with in all of these different dogs, we only found a few different uh, diseases that were in the sled dogs themselves. Now you do have to remember that a lot of the genetic tests that Embark puts out, they might have been found in dogs of a completely different breed, like a Chihuahua or something that is not related to a sled dog. Um, but with that said, your dogs are still tested for all of those variants. And out of all of those variants, these are the only ones that came back within our sled dog population. So many of them, very, very low incidence, you know, one or two dogs or a very few dogs, maybe a particular lineage of dogs in one kennel. But there were a couple up here that I have stars next to that stood out to us. So I'm going to skip right to the middle one, Alaskan Husky Encephalopathy. This is actually one that I was involved in where due to a very popular sire that was an exceptional sled dog that was bred within a kennel and across kennels, 
Um, the problem was this particular dog, he himself was a carrier for this Alaskan Husky encephalopathy. This is a recessive trait. So when you're a carrier, you don't even know the dog has it. But as he became very popular and lots of offspring, and then some, you know, there was more inbreeding, um, some of these dogs started demonstrating this. And it's a horrible disease. It's a fatal neurologic disease for sled dogs. So I was involved in a study with this particular musher and some other kennels to identify the, the mutation that causes that. So this is already publicized in Bark Test Dogs for this. So we were able to basically, through this genotyping, see how frequent is it in sled dogs. Um, and it was still seen in some of the sled dog population, um, but at least it's at a lower frequency, thank goodness. Another one that came up was this ichthyosis. I had no idea what that was. I had to look it up. And it's a, it's a skin disorder that's seen in many different dogs. And over on the right, you can see a picture of like a really red belly on a dog. Um, but the other thing is you tend to see uh, the pads of their feet will be like dry and cracked, that type of thing. So I had never heard about any skin problems in the sled dogs we sampled. So I went back and all 15 of these dogs were from one kennel. And so I went back to this owner of the kennel. I didn't tell him what I found yet. And I said, do you have any skin problems? And he's like, nope. And he said, okay. So I was a little bit puzzled. I, I still didn't tell him. And then I was at a workshop where one of our sled dog veterinarians was talking about the proper fit of a harness and how some dogs are more prone to getting harness rub. So I went back to this kennel owner and I said, do you have any dogs that get harness rub? This, this particular owner, he races the Iditarod, the Yukon Quest, so really long distance races. And he came back, he said, yes, I do occasionally. Not, not horrible, but yes, I do. And so I had him, I took the list of dogs, I said, mark all the dogs that you have that have this harness rub. And he marked 14 dogs. 14 of those dogs were of the 15 that had this particular condition. So it was really unique that it was something we never even realized that these dogs in his kennel likely have this underlying skin condition that doesn't manifest in a horrible way in sled dogs, but does leave them at risk for some of this harness rub, um, especially when they're in these elite endurance uh, events. So that was really interesting. And then the last one on here is a lower normal ALT in serum. So what the heck does that mean? That doesn't sound like a disease and it's not. So ALT is a normal enzyme that's circulating in your bloodstream um, and in muscles and tissues. With that said, when you have elevated ALT, from a veterinary standpoint, this usually means that there's some type of liver damage. However, this particular condition, it's not high, it's actually normal, and it's on the low side of normal. So what does this mean? So we don't know a biological means for this particular condition. And that's what I'm trying to find out. Because as you can see, 62% of our sled dogs and 74% of the Siberian Huskies have this particular variant that it has this associated low level of ALT. And this has clinical implications because if your dog is normally low for this, as they may get older and have liver damage, your veterinarian might not recognize the beginning stages of liver damage because as their, liver, as their ALT increases, it might still be in the normal range, but now it's high normal. So it does have biological implications for health. But the other thing is, if you look at the biological function of ALT itself, it's also related to energy metabolism. So of course I'm excited because I want to know how does this relate to energy. And so I want to look at this and we're just getting into this particular one to try to figure out how does this relate to energy and is it actually related to their athletic performance? So now kind of going back to a bigger picture of health and longevity and performance. Um, one of the things that we have been working on for the last four years is this VICA project. So VICA has its own web page for our project, VICA.org. Um, this is a study of canine aging. So <laughs> your genetics lesson or my lecture, is really this premise that DNA gets damaged as you age. So when you're young, your DNA is young and it's healthy and, and it's, you know, it's vibrant. Whereas as we age and we have that biological clock, basically we get more mutations, our DNA doesn't repair as well, it doesn't copy as well. And we can have things from the environment 
that, that also cause DNA to be damaged or increases the rate of damage. But even if you had the perfect life, the best diet, the best environment, you still have kind of a biological time clock. All mammals do. Even the healthiest people have a similar endpoint as unhealthy people. So one of the unique things in this is that all of our genomes actually have these old pieces of DNA that have integrated themselves with our genome over time. And they're pieces of like ancient viruses. And they don't really cause you to be sick or, or have, you know, a disease right then. But over time, as you age, these viruses, they're copied just like all of your DNA. And they also move around in your genome. And so this does cause problems. It messes up your DNA sequence so things don't work as well. And sometimes they can accidentally be turned on. So bottom line, we decide we're going to look at this weird, complicated part and figure out is this related to aging? And what we do know is that over time, as these elements move throughout your genome and get turned on, it, it's related to inflammation and aging. So what if we're able to treat a dog or other mammals with an antiviral medication so that it turns these back off, it inactivates them, and therefore, can we lessen the signs of aging? Um, can we extend life? So that's kind of our, our big picture is that we want to look at improving canine longevity and their well-being. And this is also appropriate for thinking about human medicine as well. And the reality of this study, we've been doing it for four years, is that we do tons of stuff to assess aging in dogs. So we have a cohort of dogs I'm going to show you a couple pictures about. And we do everything from looking at their immune system, their behavior, their, their basic health, their physical fitness, and their genome. So we look at aging from all different directions. And like I said, we have a cohort of dogs. This is a cohort of 104 sled dogs that we brought to Ithaca, New York. And this was no small feat. So you can see it was crazy. We were trucking dogs. Uh, we were flying dogs, all different things. Me, my students, I wrangled sled dog mushers into this. Um, but we brought a whole colony of 104 retired sled dogs. So the youngest sled dog we brought in was eight years old. And these sled dogs came from all over North America, including many dogs from Alaska as well. So we did a lot of traveling in the first year. Um, and, and before you get to the idea of like, oh my goodness, this is a research colony of dogs and, and have any stereotype ideas, let me tell you about the retirement home that these dogs have. So we have a whole building that's been repurposed just for our sled dog colony. Every dog has their own kennel, so there's no competition with feeding time. With that said, once they're done eating, we can pull dividers in their kennels, and the dogs can socialize with their other dogs. So there's some kennels that have like five kennels combined with five dogs. On top of this, we built these huge fenced-in fields where the dogs go out to play in social groups twice a day. So they're outside, they're playing, my students and staff are all there with them. Um, and then they come back in, they have their dog beds, their toys, and staff um, that take care of them all the time. And so the dogs really acclimated to this really well. You can see them, they're running down the hall to run outside to playtime. They play in the snow, in the spring. Uh, this was um, Halloween when one of my students dressed up. So you can see we have a lot of fun here. Um, but back to the research then, uh, my colleague Joe Wachschlag, he heads the general health and biobanking of samples. So the most invasive thing we do with these dogs is once a year, they're anesthetized, they have a CT scan, and they have a small uh, biopsy um, that's about the size of your pencil eraser. So Joe leads this part. My colleague John Loftus, another veterinarian, he's the immunologist. So all of our blood samples that we collect, those blood samples go to him to look at how does uh, the immune system uh, change and respond as a dog ages. My responsibility is the physical conditioning because my background is with sled dogs and racing sled dogs. So we've basically gone here and we have, we taught the dogs how to run on the treadmill. Um, we get heart rates. You can see on the right-hand side, we have different ways that we've tried to monitor heart rates while they're running in respiration. Um, the treadmill has sensors. It can identify when dogs are lame, um, how far they've gone, how long they've gone, what speed they've gone. 
Um, in addition to this, a well, more simpler way of looking at physical conditioning is weight pull. So one dog just pulls a cart of weight down our hallway. So this test we also do twice a year. So we look at how does their physical condition change as the dog ages. And then the, the last big part of this study of aging is looking at their behavior, specifically cognitive dysfunction, which is similar to um, Alzheimer's in humans. So we have a whole variety of tests. Um, that we look at how dogs move around, how they respond to novel objects, a mirror, or problem solving. Um, and we also have question questionnaires, we ask the handlers, all of these things to assess how they age. So the bottom line of this project, we're four years into it, we have buckets of data that we're analyzing. We've completed the first trial, um, a drug trial, and we're starting the second one, and, and we're really analyzing data. So. Stay tuned and see what comes out of the study and how we can help um, extend our dog's uh, longevity. And the last couple of things I just wanted to tell you guys about is, you know, always coming back to my interest in performance. Some of the genetics research that we've done is looked at how selection of dogs within a breed, so within Siberian Huskies, how their genome has changed based on how we use them. So. Siberians, again, are, are traditional sled dogs, but now some Siberians are bred specifically as a show dog or real purposely as a pet dog. And so how does that change their genome? And we found really interesting signatures of selection on the genome related to their conformation and bone growth, metabolism, and behavior related to Siberian Huskies. We've done the same thing in sled dogs, comparing those sprint dogs to the distance dogs. And we found all kinds of fun things related to their metabolism, um, energy um, metabolism, locomotion, circulation, muscle contraction, all kinds of stuff. So these are two studies that we're still working on, but our preliminary results are super cool and I'm really excited about them. And the last thing is probably the part that got me into studying genetics of sled dogs. And it's really the idea of if we understand the genetics of their performance and their health, can we take a blood sample and use that DNA to predict their future potential um, and, and how we can manage them and train them? And so a huge project we have ongoing right now is genetic prediction of performance and health traits in working dogs, not just sled dogs, but also guide dogs and detection dogs. So that's a huge project that is ongoing right now. And with that, I've told you all kinds of stuff that I do research on in sled dogs that has taken me years and it's still ongoing. And there's lots of people in my lab as well as other universities and programs uh, that I'd like to thank for all of their collaboration and support with this. And probably the biggest people I need to thank uh, for this particular one is all the sled dog mushers that have stuck with me over decades now to collect these samples. So I really appreciate all of uh, their help and support and all the sled dogs that we're working with. Thank you so much. Hello everyone and welcome to the live Q&A portion of this presentation. I'm joined by Dr. Heather Husson. Uh, thank you very much for being here and for that informative presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, as I, so as I referenced in the introduction I read for you, uh, you have had quite an interesting career. I, I wondered just to start off if you could highlight uh, just briefly what led you to be in this space in the first place. Um, I think the big thing is, you know, kind of passion for animal health and animal performance. And for me, genetics really became the tool for me to study that and to contribute to that field, to improving animals, their production, health, performance, all of those. So, so yeah, it was really a passion for animals and genetics became my tool and a very winding path to get here. Yeah, got it. Well, I would, I would love to spend all afternoon learning more about the sled dogs and some of the other work that you've done. Um, for now, though, we only have a few minutes, and I see a number of questions have already come in. So as a reminder to everyone watching, please feel free to keep submitting questions, um, and we'll answer as many of them as we can here. So uh, just to jump right into the first one, um, there's a question that asks, um, is the work ethic trait identifiable genetically? 
Uh, based on our data so far, yes. So, so we've characterized the dogs on this work ethic on, you know, dogs that really don't want to be sled dogs. They don't want to be pulling in the harness out on the trail to dogs that are on the trail. They're, they're running and stuff, but they're not necessarily, they don't have the highest amount of drive. And then, you know, it's kind of the elite group are the dogs that drive through, you know, on the trail all the time, no matter what. And our preliminary genetic studies is showing us that there is an association. We're finding an association of genomic regions to that trait um, using those just different categories. So, so far, yes, I would say absolutely there is a genetic component to work ethic in sled dogs. Got it. Got it. All right. Next uh, question here. Does myosin 9 occur in several breeds? So the gene itself is going to be in all dog breeds. It's in dogs, but how it's expressed is could be different. So I think for the majority of the dogs, you know, it, it kind of has a typical expression related to our muscle composition. But for the first time that it was really kind of brought out in dog genetics, it was identified as uh, the contributing factor to uh, whippets and racing whippets, and they were seeing these these dogs also that they were calling bully whippets. And this is where it really first came out and said, you know, this particular gene contributes to this muscling in whippets. Now that gene is also studied and very well known for muscling in cattle and beef cattle. Um, but how it came out in the whippets was, it really was related when you had it in a heterozygous form. So just one copy of it, it increased muscling, and that slight increase in muscling was correlated to their winning streak. Whereas if they had two copies, homozygous, they became kind of this um, Arnold Schwarzenegger type of uh, whippet, and they were called bully whippets, and they had too much muscling, actually, and, and it detracted from their performance. And so it, it was a great way. That was out before I even started sled dog genetics, so I'm like, of course I'm going to check this. Um, but that mutation that they found in the whippets was not found in sled dogs. So we didn't find any correlation. So the gene is there in all dogs, but that difference in expression and muscling was really only found in whippets in particular. Interesting, interesting. And I know obviously we have a lot of a lot of breeders in the audience as well as veterinarians, and there's there's often questions that say, you know, how does this vary by breed? You know, whatever the given topic might be. Um, Speaking of which, I see a, a number of questions have come in about ALT, each one referencing different breeds. So maybe just starting with that on a general level, then we'll get into some of these specifics. Could you just highlight again what ALT is and are there important differences by breed? Sure. So ALT is, you know, so I guess I should start this with, I am not a veterinarian. <laughs> so keep that in mind as, as I'm kind of going through from my research perspective. But, you know, I really started digging into this because a lot of our work uh, with the sled dogs, we were identifying that many sled dogs were coming back with this mutation that's correlated with low but normal levels of ALT. And, and I was like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and uh, so for that, you know, as I looked into ALT, from a veterinary background and kind of clinically, ALT is more commonly looked at this enzyme where when you have increased levels of ALT, that suggests liver damage. So normally from a clinical perspective, they're looking at when you have increased levels, what type of situations may be contributing to liver damage in that animal. And, but like these results, low normal ALTs, and you know, it contradicts that. We're not looking at liver damage. We're like, why is it lower in, in low but normal ranges? And uh, so, so yeah, at least for the sled dogs, you know, we don't really know yet. Um, I did a bit of research and going, well, okay, aside from liver damage, what the heck does ALT do? And it really does have kind of this fascinating way of transitioning kind of energy metabolites between muscle and liver um, and, and getting those metabolites there to make energy. And it also relates to transitioning between aerobic and anaerobic um, energy. So, you know, it has this really interesting component that is related to energy metabolism. And that's kind of where I'm digging into this more for sled dogs, because I'm wondering, is this kind of a unique factor that contributes to working dogs and especially sled dogs in energy metabolism? So that's kind of where I'm yeah. digging into it from, uh, from my perspective. Got it. 
Got it. Okay. Well, let's jump into a couple of these kind of breed specific versions then and see um, see where we get to. So the first, I believe Belgian shepherds have a significant percentage with low ALT, especially the Malinois. Could this be a factor in working? I, I, I hypothesize it is, that it might be. I don't have the data to say yes or no yet. We're collecting data. So we are pursuing this in the sled dogs in particular. Um, and it'll probably be something, you know, down the road. I work with guide dogs and detection dogs. Um, so I would certainly, knowing that, you know, someone's brought up the Belgian Malinois, I know a, a number of these dogs that are in different detection uh, or law enforcement groups. So, so I'll keep that in my hat for the future, but I don't know right now. Okay. And is there a connection? There's a question about Jack Russell lines. Is there a connection to high energy levels? You know, the Jack Russell breed or, or other breeds for that matter. I wish I had answers for you. <laughs> um, I, I really do. It's it's one that, you know, I really am curious about this in, you know, is it related to energy and whether it's just kind of high energy for a dog breed or is it related to, uh, you know, that selection for performance in working dogs? Um, you know, that all goes back to kind of energy metabolism. And so maybe it really is playing a role in that. Um, so hopefully as, as we get into this, I have to say, you're all spiking, you know, my interest in, in going beyond, you know, just sled dogs. Right now I'm just working in sled dogs for the ALT part. Um, but now of course you have me all interested in like, oh, I got to add this group of dogs and that group. So we'll see. <laughs> got it. Got it. Well, as a as a comment for our, our audience, and then I'll ask you one kind of final question to wrap up here. Um, Embark tests for ALT as a clinical trait. Um, specifically, we're looking at um, if, there, if the dog has one or two copies of a variant, that would mean the dog is more likely to have low um, ALT levels. So when that um, test result comes back from Embark, the general recommendation is to test the dog to actually establish what the baseline is as a as a reference point. So I'm also not a veterinarian, and some of our team is in the Embark booth now who can kind of provide more specific guidance on on using ALT results, at least on the Embark side. Um, but as for you, Dr. Husan, um, as a final kind of wrap up note, um, you know, do you have a, a call to action or a key message you want to leave the audience with before we close? Sure. Um, the big thing for for me, I guess, and in, in for all of you in the audience is, you know, I do research primarily focusing on working dogs. I've had a real interest in, you know, the function and the performance of working dogs, as well as their health and how that relates to them. So a lot of my research is really focused on working dogs, not just sled dogs. As I mentioned, I work with guide dogs. I work with detection dogs. I have a real interest in hunting dogs. Um, so those are kind of traits and groups, uh, you know, if you have a group, uh, or a breed that's particularly in this and, you know, you have an interest in learning genetics about that, I am very open to those. I collaborate with various different organizations, whether it's the Siberian Husky Club or Penn Vet Working Dog Center or the Seeing Eye. So I do work with a lot of different groups related to performance as well as health within those working dog groups. Um, and of course, I, I also have a sweet spot for fast dogs. Uh, so not just sled dogs, but also uh, sight hounds in particular. I have a real interest there. So I, I would say I'm, I'm volunteering myself, not that I can answer every question, um, but I'm certainly open to working with groups uh, to pursue these things. And I commend you all, you know, don't be afraid, don't be shy, reach out to researchers and ask questions. I certainly get the individual emails, you know, asking about a particular problem within their own kennel or their farm. Um, but I also get a lot of questions related to breed associations or, or organizations. So don't be shy, reach out. We will do what we can and uh, go from there. Terrific. Well, well, thank you again. And that is, that is certainly, I think, consistent with some of the other messages we've heard over the last two days here at the summit about contributing to, to research and being proactive. So thank you again very much. Really appreciate um, you being part of the Canine Health Summit. And thanks for the great presentation and question and answer session. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. And for our, for our viewers, the next 
uh, sessions have, have already started. You can go back to the auditorium and choose from one of two different options, one by Dr. Danica Banash on chondrodystrophy, what it is and why we seem to, to like it so much, and the other by Dr. Antti Ivan Ivan on studies in canine hip dysplasia. So via the auditorium, you can select one of those, and thanks again for attending this session.